WXII 12 News at 6 starts right now. Whipping wind and torrential rain causing all kinds of problems, including power outages and flooding in the Piedmont Triad. This is our 11th straight day for storms. And as people try to clear damage from days before, the rain just keeps on coming. Six o'clock starts with team coverage tonight. This pattern of evening storms still hitting us hard in the Piedmont Triad. Look at this behind us. Yeah, you can see on the radar it is incredibly active. Meteorologist uh, Lenny Pope is in the studio now to tell us exactly where we can expect the worst in the hours ahead. Lainey. Well, thankfully, I can tell you that the worst so far is behind us as the storms are moving off to the east and they are weakening. But boy, did they come in fast and furious this afternoon. After about two o'clock, we saw the storms forming just east of the mountains in the foothills and then racing across the triad in a line here. And all along that line, there was the potential for very strong winds and wind damage. And we're still getting reports in of trees down here and there. Yadkin County out near Elkin. Also, you're seeing some tree reports down in Walkertown out toward Clemens at a 59 mile per hour wind gust that was actually reported at PTI Airport. So those winds were easily 60 miles an hour as they pushed through the area. As I mentioned, the storms are weakening. We do still have some rain over Yanceyville, Reedsville, Madison, Mayadan, and some lightning and a heavy downpour southeast of Burlington, extending back toward Pleasant Garden. Also, a few storms with some gusty winds to 30 40 miles an hour as well as heavy downpours just north and south of Ashboro and also south of High Rock Lake. If you're out to the west in Wilkes and Yakin County you still have at least a little leftover rain. Now this is the first wave of storms today. We may see another area building into the mountains and foothills later on tonight. Any of the storms that develop tonight and then again tomorrow have that heavy rain flooding potential as well as damaging winds and large hail. Lenny, thank you very much. All this rain and all this wind causing all kinds of power problems as well. Thousands upon thousands of people in the dark right now. Duke Energy in particular reporting almost 8,400 outages in Forsyth County, another 2,000 plus in Guilford County. Those numbers up nearly 4,000 power outages since just 4 o'clock alone. Power lines, trees coming down left and right. This photo from University Parkway in Winston-Salem, not too far from Coliseum Drive. We are also getting reports of traffic lights being out, so be careful on the roads tonight. If you come to a light that's out, treat it as a four-way stop for sure. Storms have also hit the city of High Point particularly hard this week. Last night's storm brought down trees all over the city. Yeah, it's been extremely intense. Steve King on Edgewood Drive where a tree came falling down on a home. Steve, people were inside that home and that tree fell. How are they doing tonight? Jalitha is still very shaken up. Now this really just says it all. You can see what yesterday's storm did here in High Point. This is one of 30 trees that came down throughout the city. Emily Feliciano was in the living room that the tree landed on. She was in there with her sister and her little cousin and they really had no idea what happened. She says that when this tree fell down, she heard a big crashing sound, but she was really disoriented. She got up, went outside, and then saw the damage and was shocked to see what had happened. Right now, she has a bump on her forehead, but thankfully, somehow, even though five people were in the home at the time, nobody was seriously hurt. I'm so thankful that um, God was like with us right now. He, did, he protected us. He, he put his hands over our, our on top of us, and. We just prayed at the moment, and I'm so thankful that we no one got hurt. Now again, city leaders say that nobody was seriously hurt throughout the city, even though that this is one of 30 trees that came crashing down during the height of the storm. Now this storm did come all of a sudden. I was actually here in High Point yesterday working on another story, waiting to go live, when all of a sudden the weather turned from sunny outside to ominous clouds and then the heavy rain and very strong wind. So these storms do come quick. Everyone should be very careful. Speaking of being careful, emergency crews want to remind everybody to stay away from any downed power lines. If you don't know whether they're live or not live, just treat them as such and stay as far away from them as you possibly can. Reporting live in High Point, Steve King, WXII 12 News. 
Good advice. Thank you, Steve. Still more damage to tell you about at High Point. This is a look outside the former home for the Shakespeare Festival. This is on West Ward Avenue. Gusty winds ripped off part of the roof. Shingles and insulation went flying everywhere. That is all on the ground tonight. Not just there, more damage in Kernersville as well, where neighbors say this damage behind us could have been so much worse. Yes, yeah, Sky 12 flew over the Century Park neighborhood, giving us a look from up above and all the trees that were uprooted because of last night's weather. Lucas Pritchard was inside of his home when a tree split right in half and fell on his house. No one was hurt, but the owners no doubt shaken. Getting darker, but nothing really catastrophic and kind of heard the wind pick up. Looked outside, it's raining sideways, like just white, heavy rain. Similar story to what Steve was telling us in High Point. The neighbors here say they are extraordinarily lucky. They think things could have been a whole lot worse because of how many trees are in their neighborhood. Meantime, a Gilran firefighter is recovering right now after being shocked from a downed power line. Yeah, Battalion Chief Joey Lane got a little too close to a line yesterday. He was at a house fire on Old Mendenhall Road in Archdale. That's not far from West Fairfield Road and Highway 70. That power line came down during a severe thunderstorm in the area. To monitor the storms in real time, download our WXII app in the App Store. You can find radar and weather alerts so that you don't get caught in the rain. Wake Forest head volleyball coach Bill Ferguson is resigning his post. He's one of 50 people indicted in that nationwide college admission scandal that's been in the news for months. That's right. Ferguson had been on leave from the university since March 12th. Federal investigators say that he received a $1,000 payment to help a student on a wait list get into Wake by saying that person was on the volleyball team. He pleaded not guilty and Ferguson says in a statement, quote, it is essential that I step aside so that the team Team and coaches can continue to move forward while I focus on this case and focus on my family. I look forward to the success the program will enjoy." End quote. Interim coach Randy Smart will continue leading the team. Elsewhere tonight, efforts to recruit and hire more female and minority police officers are paying off for one triad department. And Bill O'Neill joins us now in Burlington to explain how some of the police force's newest officers can make a big impact in the community. Half a dozen years ago, the police chief here in Burlington says more than 90% of the new officers were white men. Take a look at today's graduating class. Will Ferguson, Miguel Gomez, and Grace Gunter are the city's newest police officers. Quite a change from just two years ago when the graduating class featured six white officers and one black officer, all men. In our department, I know that we have the most females now than we have ever had. The latest numbers show 17% of Burlington's police officers are women. Officer Grace Gunter comes from a police family and has a degree in linguistics. Is it important that we have female officers? I think so. I think um, people in the community, sometimes they don't want to talk to a male. You know, you have female victims that might feel more comfortable talking to a female. Are you fluent in Spanish? I am. Hispanic officers make up 6% of the Burlington PD. That's twice the number from two years ago. Officer Miguel Gomez, who serves in the Marine Reserves, is bilingual and says he thinks it's very important for the city to have Hispanic officers. A lot of times uh, the Hispanic population is scared to report crimes and that trust between the, them and the officers can sometimes be strained because of that language barrier. You have a split second to make a decision and you better pray to God that's the right decision. Officer Will Ferguson, who has a master's degree in adult education, says he chose Burlington over several other cities in part because of his interview with the police chief. I don't think I've ever walked away from a, a more encouraging um, um, interview. He joins a department where 14% of the officers are African American, a 40% increase from two years ago. I do think there is a, a, a degree by which we can do a better job of, of um, training and preparing um, officers. All three officers say they want to improve relations with the community. All three say they believe they have something to offer. You have fear for your, your own safety on this job? I do, but I also think about the fact that uh, somebody has to do it, you know, and not many people want to do it nowadays, so I figured, you know, I'd be selfish if I didn't do it. Starting salaries for Burlington police officers ranges between thirty-nine dollars and $41,000 a year, depending on education. 
Two years ago, the city began paying cadets for their training. Officers say it makes a big difference. And when you're offering that incentive, you know, we will pay you to go through the academy, I think it just makes it more accessible to everybody. The Guilford County Sheriff's Department just announced it will begin paying to train new officers in an effort to attract better candidates for the job. In Burlington, Bill O'Neill, WXII 12 News. Bill, thank you. If you see suspicious looking military activity over the next few weeks, an Army spokesperson says you do not need to worry. It is almost certainly part of special forces training that's set to happen in 21 counties across North Carolina. The counties in our area include Alamance, Davidson, Davie, Guilford, Montgomery and Randolph. These exercises are expected to take place from August 30th to September 12th. The Army says the training resembles extreme role playing in which trainees may fire blanks and even engage with Fort Bragg soldiers at Acting as guerrilla fighters. In commitment 2020, presidential candidate Kamala Harris will be in North Carolina this weekend. Senator Harris will speak at the 84th Founders Banquet for the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People. This will happen on Saturday night. Then she plans to attend a church service in Durham Sunday morning. That afternoon, she will be in Greensboro for a campaign event at Smith High School. It has been one week since Dale Earnhardt Jr. and his family survived a plane crash. Jr. is still healing from what he is calling pain and bruising, but says he still plans to race next weekend. Dale Earnhardt Jr. was flying with his wife and their young daughter when their plane went down last Thursday in Tennessee. Remarkably, despite the plane, what it looked after the fact, no one was seriously hurt. Earnhardt Jr. retired from full time racing at the end of the 2017 Cup season, but still gets back in the car every once in a while. He tweeted that he does still plan to race at Darlington over Labor Day weekend. He says, quote, my lower back is bruised up real bad, lots of swelling, and I just need that to go down and the pain to chill out. I've been treating the area every day solely to get well to race. I have a plan B, but hope not to use it.